with us in the house. And, uh, as I've said many times before, if you're just watching online, you've never been here, you need to come at least once. And you won't be disappointed, but we're grateful for everyone that's with us tonight. And uh, we're going to have a good time this Wednesday. It warmed up a little bit from last night. Amen. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Do you love the Lord? I said, do you love the Lord?
got a lot of, of sick to pray for still. Uh, many are affected, continually affected by the virus. Um, we want to remember uh, Sister Rochelle. We want to remember it, Sister Nadine. Uh, we want to remember Sister Sharon's sister and, uh, and some other family, I think, perhaps, her caregiver. And uh, uh, we heard about some more today. Brother McKinney. He needs prayer, folks. Brother McKinney is in dire need of prayer. And uh, uh, we uh, want to remember uh, uh, several uh, unspoken requests, several things perhaps don't need to be mentioned publicly. But uh, uh, we know a God that heals. Amen. 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 I'll ask you to pray about something else, too. The Bible says one plants, another waters. God gives the increase. Um, last time we checked, uh, last time my lovely wife checked, there have been over 3,600 people have viewed Brother Tony's funeral on Facebook. And if they heard the message, they heard the gospel. And we need to pray over all them people. Brother David, what a blessing if we can get to see revival. Because he said you planted another will water it and I will give the increase. Man, you talk about the seed for revival. My goodness, man. To reach that many people. Uh, even if half of them only watch the sermon. I mean, it's incredible. So let's pray about that. Be in prayer. About that. Does anybody over here have requests? Anybody? Anybody? Brother Billy? Remember Diller's wife tomorrow. He's having to do a sir. Oh, goodness. All right. Let's remember him. Sister Eloise? All right, huh? Yes, indeed. Sister Ashley? Miss Marie? Yeah, Miss Marie's had the surgery tomorrow. Stuff, pray for them. 
Call their name now. God is able. Now, she didn't just come by there once. She came by there time after time after time saying, I want to come to your church. I want to feel what you feel. I want to experience what you experience. And she just never could make that step. We haven't. I, I, I'm not saying I believe we have it. I'm telling you, we have it. We have the answer for the world today. Amen. Let's pray together right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Oh, what a mighty God. When I consider the song, the moon, the stars, and all that is therein, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And here at 1031 Mill Street tonight, God, we pray. And we pray for the sick, and we pray for the downhearted and the downtrodden. We pray for the, the, the addicts, Lord, those that are struggling with addiction. We pray for those that are struggling with any disease. And we declare the name of Jesus in their heart and in their situation and in their family. And the name of Jesus is the name that's above every name. God, every name is the name of the above them whereby we must be saved. I declare the name of Jesus over this young lady and her family. I declare the name of Jesus over every request that was brought up tonight. I declare the name of Jesus in the place of hope and 
work in this house tonight. The Spirit is moving. The Spirit is working. It's time to receive our evening offering, Wednesday evening offering, and tithing if applicable. well. Of course, as usual, we take cash and checks uh, through the website. You can do PayPal through riverbendpentecostals.com. And uh, then, of course, there are, uh, I brought a whole stack of tithing envelopes down tonight. People that brought them by the house or called and we went to pick them up. And, and uh, the giving has been tremendous. Tremendous. I can't, I can't commend you enough for continuing to give. I do want to remind you that we only have about a week and a half left in this year. If you made a pledge, an envelope pledge, our first uh, offering is due in January, Christmas for Christ. And uh, we've been able to meet all of our obligations this year. And the Lord's been good about that. We haven't had not one bit of trouble. And uh, uh, everyone has really been so good to give. So uh, we remind you to do that. But... Uh, uh, we're going to say the prayer. The prayer works. I uh, I know there are some that are still skeptical. I really can't understand how. Because I get a testimony from the Blake Holmes weekly from somebody that says that prayer works. Checks in the mail, gives some surprises. Sister Brent, we've had people get raises, like huge raises. We've had people get bonuses. We've had people have show up and not only was their bills taken care of, but they got a refund on those bills. And the Lord has just done some incredible, incredible things for the people in this assembly. He's, he could have, he's always done it, but especially since we've been praying this prayer. Uh, I, uh, we even had a little fella, he only comes once in a while because his parents don't live for the Lord. He wants to come all the time, but his mama doesn't come at all. And uh, uh, he... Uh, he started praying this prayer, Brother David, and the Lord came through for him. And he told it all over the place. Everybody he talked to, he said, that prayer works. When I started saying that prayer, God bless my mom. And, uh, hey, yeah. it's faith. That's all it is, Brother David. It's not a magical formula. It's just faith. It's a simply a declaration of faith. So, Sister Heidi, if you're pulling up for us, we're going to pray the prayer of faith. On the authority of your word, I have given it, it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring you the day into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there's not enough room to receive. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses. Sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises. Bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God and working health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in, I'm blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'll tell you this, as you get ready to bring your offerings, Sister Carol came Sunday morning under uh, an uh, edict from Brother Johnny because he gave her his billfold when he went to the hospital and they had a $20 bill in it. And he said, that's for the offering. And he never made it back to church, but she showed up something and she brought that and put it in the offering. Of course, little angel did it for her. And uh, that probably gives her the double blessing that we brought to give by the angel. But, uh, uh, and, hey, we're a giving people. It's a legacy of giving. Amen? Amen. The legacy of giving. Bring your offerings. Sister Man is going to say the Lord.
sure can. Absolutely.
trust me when I tell you, the book says, when the gospel has been preached in all the world, the end is coming. Brother Billy, if we're reaching over 3,000 people at a funeral service, it's going out tonight. It's nothing, Brother Blake, for us to have five or six hundred views on a regular service. People are hearing the gospel at a rapid pace. Do you know that there are more people hearing the gospel today than there was in January and February? More people are hearing the gospel through the pandemic because churches everywhere have went online. This could be the day. This could be the day. Well, Brother David, I'm telling you, back when they used to read the scripture, it would be grinding in the wheel. One taken, one left. Two in the bed, one taken, one left. Two working in the field, one taken and one left. Used to send something through and say, Maria, I don't want to be left behind forever and ever. I don't want to be left behind. Children, remember being kids, won't y'all come up to the front? There's not very many tonight, but there's a bunch. One, two, three. We've had several graduating out of Riverbend kids to the student ministry. Y'all go right ahead, Sister Kristen. Y'all tear up Jack back there. Uh, and then the other students will be dismissed. Go to the family center. If you happen to come into the family center and tables and chairs are scattered all over the place, that's just been me over there working. Trying to figure out how to go back to having Sunday school over there. We're going to do elements right after the first of the year. We're going to try to crank that up again. And uh, I want to be able to get everybody over there and have enough donuts and coffee for everybody. Amen. Brother, Larry, do you need more? I love it. I love it, man. It makes my night when I don't have enough coffee. Amen. It my night. Um, before we get into the Bible study, I'll just let you know that uh, does anybody not remember what we preached Sunday? Anybody not remember? I usually say how many remember. And about we'll, we'll six hands will go up. I say how many don't remember? I talk about the bones got to come together. Did anybody read that passage after that to see? The Lord didn't do nothing for the bones, Brother Billy. He just made them a promise. Have you ever noticed that before? I've always just in my mind just assumed the Lord did it. But he didn't. He preached to the house of Israel. And they started coming together. And uh, last night we had our small group. Monday night we had prayer. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I, I, I just strongly encourage you. We have prayer meetings a little different now. The first Monday is ladies' prayer. The second Monday is men's prayer. The third Monday is the students and the children's prayer. And then the fourth Monday is one hour of prayer. I don't know how the ladies do, but men's prayer is powerful. There is a move of God. As soon as we start praying, you just feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. Men are important to the kingdom of God. Amen. They are. And when we come together, good things happen. Now, we preached Sunday that a promised blessing is coming. And uh, uh, by the time I get into the Bible study, Brother Larry will be back. And uh, before the blessing can come, the bones have to come together. Before the blessing can come, there has to be order. Now, I'm going to make myself a little vulnerable here, but I bet you, if I could bet, I know somebody was thinking like him, well, brother, we don't bet. <laughs> it's just a figure of speech. But I bet you, brother David, that over the last three years, 
I've preached or taught on the border 15 times. And guess how long I'm going to have to keep preaching? Till we get it. The church has got to come alive, folks. We've got to come alive with passion. Last Wednesday, the last Wednesday that we met, I can't remember how long since I've been here on a Wednesday night, but it's been a minute. And uh, the last Wednesday that we met, Brother David talked, and I watched church every time I was out in quarantine. I watched church, but I hated it. I hated it. It gave me the worst anxiety. You can ask my wife, I run up, I was 14 to my bedroom, but I couldn't stay there. I run up and down the stairs, I walked all the way, walked into Carly's room, walked into Garrison's room. I was just like, they're having great church in my behinds and all. Something wrong with this picture. I mean, really, I, I just did not like it at all. I'm glad we had it. I'm thankful, so thankful that we had it. And like Brother Shannon was saying last night, I'm very thankful that we had it. But it ain't my cup of tea. I want to be here. And, uh, but Brother David taught. I watched Brother Richard. I watched Brother David. I watched uh, Brother Larry. And uh, uh, we, uh, Brother David taught on love. And uh, how the love of God, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And tonight, we're going to go a little bit further down that road because love is the most important attribute of a child of God. Amen. Love is. We are known as disciples of Jesus Christ because we have love one for another. Without love, no religious acts supernatural manifestations of the Spirit, no gifting or operation of the Spirit has anything to it if you don't have love first. You can talk in tongues six days a week and twice on Sunday. You can dress right, look right, talk right, everything, but if you don't love people, it means nothing. Nothing. If you don't have love. Now, I'm going to review just a little bit some previous lessons I've taught, but perhaps from a new place. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 16 through verse number 19 says, And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein, everybody say herein, herein. is our love made perfect. So when you come to a complete and full understanding, we have known and believed. You look at that in the literal translation and it says, and we have come to know and come to believe the love that God had to us. That's where our love is made perfect. What does it mean that there our love is made perfect? It's complete, but it's a process. It's a learning experience. Can I tell you that you've got to learn to love the right way? Now, uh, Sister Callie and Brother Cody are the only ones that have went through this so far, but I, I have a seven-week premarital counseling course, and, and it's incredible. It's mind-blowing, the things that you can learn in there. But the everybody in here, except those that are living in a dream world will tell you that when you get married, that fuzzy, beautiful, sweet feeling ain't for real. Oh, come on. Okay? Because then you got you really got to learn to love. First morning you wake up together, they bring it all up in your face. Huh? You ain't feeling all loving of it like that. I don't care what happens on TV, it ain't real. Okay? You have to learn to love as a matter of choice, not feeling or emotion. Love is a decision. Okay? So, 
the way we learn to love the right way is not by being nice to the people, giving gifts to people. It's not by, there's not, the way we learn to love the right way is understand how God loves us. Right. Yeah. We know and believe the love God has for us. Now I want you to be thinking while we're teaching tonight, back through your life. Is there anybody in here that you've never had a day where you were just a straight up knucklehead? Okay, and guess what? You made it through it. And you know something, Brother Larry? He still loves us. All right? God still loves us. You know how I know He loves me? Because He promised He would. He told me, Brother David, that while I was yet a sinner, He loved me. That's when He committed His love toward me. If He was going to, listen, folks, this is, I don't know if this is just for me or an oversimplification, but hear me right now. God had plenty of times in my life to write me off back down the road. Yeah. I don't do that stuff no more. Am I perfect? No, I'm not. But there's a whole lot of notches on the gun back down the road. Brother Larry, he could have wrote me off and would have been justified. There wouldn't have been a thing I could have said, Brother David. I wouldn't have had an excuse. I wouldn't have had an argument. The Lord would have been justified by saying, You're done, stupid. Can I get a witness? Amen. But he didn't give up. He don't give up easy. Huh? He don't give up easy. Look what the Lord has done for us. Just think about what the Lord has done for each of us as individuals. Our love is made perfect. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness, that's confidence, in the day of judgment. That word judgment comes from the Greek word crisis, K-R-I-S-I-S. So it means that we make confident decisions in a time of crisis because of the love of God. Okay? When we realize and embrace and accept that He loves us, we live our lives with a greater confidence and a greater degree of confidence because even if I fail, He loves me. And you know what He'll do, Sister Maria? I really didn't want to go off in this too much, but He'll take my failure, Brother Shannon, and make it a teaching opportunity. Right. And only God can take your failure and bring you through it and make you better. All right, and he only does that because he loves us. There is no fear in love. I want you to think about this just for a minute. Man, I'm probably going to meddle a little bit right now. But from me, as the pastor of this church, on down, probably 75% of our congregation has spoke to me about being afraid in the house of God. I can't tell you how many people have told me, oh, I felt like running, but I was scared of what people would think. I felt like dancing, but I was afraid of what people would think. I had a message in tones to give, and I clinched it because I was afraid people would think I shouldn't be doing that. perfect love, there is no fear in love. Because perfect love casteth out fear. Now I don't have this in my notes, Brother David, but I remember well when you taught us about the churches, the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation, chapter number two, three, and four, I think it is. And the very first church he talks to, man, he just goes telling them how good they are. And it's a church in Ephesus. And, and he brags and he brags and y'all are good at this and you're good at this and you're good at this. He said, I got a problem with you. He said, you left your first love. Now we're thinking about who is it or what is it, but it's that fresh love. It's that heavenly love. It's that new convert love. And can I say it like this? Please forgive me if, I'm, if I seem disrespectful, but it's kind of dumb love. You don't know enough yet not to love everybody and everything. Huh? You know what I'm talking about? But you know what the Lord told him? He said, I don't care how much good stuff you do. Repent and get back where you were in love or I'm going to take your candlestick away from you. 
I'm going to take, did he not say that? He said, I don't care how good you are, if you don't give back your love like you're supposed to, I'm done with you. Why would he be done with them? Because he can't do nothing if you don't love one another. Because that's who he is. Did you have a comment, Brother Billy? No. Or was you just saying, good job? That's what I thought. Thank you. But look at here. Perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the bones coming together. Tonight, we're dealing with an issue that's got to get fixed. We're dealing with an issue that's got to be ordered. And the order is, there's no room for fear in the house of God. We've got to get rid of all the fear that impedes us. Because when you're fearful, what do you do? What happens when the Holy Ghost says, run? And you don't. You, what's that? The book says, quench not the spirit. And how many times throughout our life of being Pentecost have we seen somebody yield to the Holy Ghost and an explosion take place? It's like electricity hopping from person to person because somebody yielded. If fear is stopping us from yielding to the Holy Ghost, the antidote is not confidence. The antidote is love. Perfect love casteth out fear. So we've got to start living it, promoting it, propagating it. And the only way we can do that, Brother Terrence, is find out what it is. What is that perfect love? What is the love that God wants us to have for one another? That Where does it come from? Where does that love come from? I don't told you. Somebody said God. Somebody said God. It's the love he has for me. It's the same love I got to have for you. What kind of revival could we have? I'm not talking about people being bold with their sin. But I'm talking about if people knew. You know how hard it is not to get down here and just start slobbing all over everybody. What would happen to our church if everybody connected to it knew? I'm fighting all kinds of hell out here. I fight it at home. I fight it on the job. I fight it at school. But if I can just get to the house of God, if I could just get with my brothers and sisters in the house of God, you know what? They love me. Yeah. Right. They love the stupid me. They love the knucklehead me. They love the meme that fails. They love the meme that comes in with a black eye and a busted nose and a fat lip. And they're not asking no questions because they love me. And the Lord says, kill the fatted calf. And guess what a revival church does? Burns it up to the house as fast as they can. Jumps in the shower and rushes up as fast as they can. And you know what they say? Brother's home. Yeah. Brother's home. Killing the fatted calf. We're about to have a party. That's what we've been looking for for months and years. That's what we've been praying for. It's yeah. restoration, revival. What oh, oh, he's done this, who cares? Right. Who cares? He just got to get to Jesus. Right. He just got to, he came home. He was dead, but now he's alive. That's what the book says in Luke 15. Yeah, man. Okay. Look at here. 19. We love him because he first loved us. That is not just something as simple as a, hey, he loves me, I'm going to love him back. No, it's a, when I come to an understanding of what his love really means. When I come to an understanding, then there starts to be something. Because the truth is, you can tell people Jesus died for you. What does that really mean by itself? We're trying to witness to people, Brother Shannon, some of them ain't never held a Bible before. But when you understand the... Oh, I'm about to preach right now. When you have a full comprehension of the love that God has for you, guess what they're going to feel? Same love. 
They're, they're going to learn. Oh, yeah. They're going to learn who Jesus is right. because of you. Right. Right. The first night you get the Holy Ghost, that's it. <coughs> it's just it. It's just it. I didn't. I wasn't particular about who I hugged. I, I promise I wandered around the front of the altar. I hugged the men. I hugged the women. I hugged the old women, the young women, the pretty women, and the young women. I hugged the men I liked and the men I didn't like. Because guess what? There wasn't no difference. Okay. Dwelling in the love of God can mean wait there. Remain, abide, stay, and wait. Did I put that on your paper? Yep. The perfection is a process. Brother Shannon, everything I'm going to teach tonight is not abracadabra, alakazam moments. Right. But it's, well, i got to learn it. The book tells me what to do. And then I've got to be in prayer and fasting and supplication and reading and personal study. I've got to figure it out, Brother Terrence. And I've got to tell the Lord. This is the perfect man. This is the perfect love. I want it. Yeah, right. Why not? Right. I want it. I want everything he has for me. Don't you? Amen. Right. Everything. Now, the manner in which Jesus lived and affected his world is the same manner in which we should live and affect our world. Love was the fuel that brought it here. Love caused him to minister. And love carried him all the way to Calvary. John chapter 3 verse number 16. Remember? Or God so loved the world. That's where it started at. That's what it happened at. God commanded his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was the love of God. He loved us when we were no good. He loved us before you were born. If we ask each one to define love, there would be a myriad of definitions. But the truth is, you can't define love except, except by what it makes you do. You define love, love is expressed in action. Like you can't tell somebody you love them and then talk bad about them, slap them, kill them, lie on them, steal from them, and tell them, I love them. You're a liar. It's just a lie. You don't love them. You love beating up on them. You love mistreating them. But you don't love them. Gary Chapman. Anybody ever heard of Gary Chapman before? He wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. I recommend it. I recommend you get it, especially if you're having any kind of uh, second thoughts in your marriage. He and his team have established with much research, much research, that there are typically five love languages. Words of affirmation, access, words of affirmation, which are exactly that. Say nice, good, lovely, flowery things to one another. Acts of service, which means you do things like uh, uh, if your wife only gets up in the morning and uh, does the dishes, then you wake up earlier than her, do all the dishes, and that tells her you love her. Right? Acts of service. Receiving gifts. If you buy something for somebody, you know, that is your expression or their expression of love. And there's quality time, which of course is self-explanatory. And then there's the one that all of us fellas get accused of liking. Physical touch. Well, don't let the ladies lie to you. They like it too. I look at Brother Blake like he's known something about it. <laughs> Even he had more reaction than anybody. I'm just teasing. Bro. I'm just teasing. But I begin to think, what's the love language of heaven? What's the love language of heaven? Love is defined by what it does, what it motivates you to do more than what it is. Love that does nothing. <laughs> Baby, I'm trying to stay in my lane here, but I I want to let the horses run a little bit and spread my wings. But 
Love is known only as it is expressed. Okay? So what's the love language of heaven? What is the love language that is fueled by heaven? We're given a very clear breakdown of love. It's agape love. Everybody say agape. agape. It's a great word for love. That is the love of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you're reading the book of 1 Corinthians, and if you're reading it through, Sister Maria, chapter 13 don't fit. Because chapter 12 and chapter 14 are talking about, anybody know what? The church, about spiritual gifts in the church. But then chapter 13 is 13 verses that's kind of out of whack. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, the gifts of the Spirit are the supernatural operation of the Holy Ghost within men and women. And they have one purpose. What's the purpose of the spiritual gifts? Edify, build up, strengthen the church. And the Corinthian church were widely used in the gifts of the Spirit, okay? But apparently, they were being used in the gifts, and they were taking that to as a manifestation of their spirituality. So if they were used in the gift of knowledge or the word of wisdom or tongues and interpretation or the gifts of healing, they would take that as saying, I'm a better Christian than you because God's using me in the gifts. Now Paul was trying to straighten that out because any time that you give a message in tongues or you have a word of knowledge or the word of wisdom and you think you're all that, go to the Old Testament and read about Balaam. And realize that if necessary, the Lord will use a donkey. And all of a sudden, you don't feel all that proud no more. Right? Okay? Just because, and don't, don't make that misunderstanding. Just because God uses somebody, you know, if the Lord uses somebody to give a message in tongues, good chance that, that those that were worthy of it wouldn't do it. That doesn't mean somebody's saved. You know there are going to be people come to the Lord at the last day and they're going to say, man, we did all kinds of stuff in your name. We healed sick in your name. We cast out devils in your name. And he's going to say, I don't even know who you are. Get out of here. Okay? So what Paul was trying to bring them in, everybody ain't going to be used in every gift, but everybody better learn this love stuff. Okay? And uh, so... Uh, Chapter 13 is kind of like to bring them back to earth. And it reminds them that the environment or the culture in which the church is designed to operate is the love culture. Everybody that's in the house of God better feel love and nobody better. That's why it's, it's kind of funny. Let me, let me bring it like this. How many of you remember somebody show up like their second service? This happened to me one time. I brought a buddy, buddy of mine to church. He he was not Holy Ghost filled. He was not. He didn't come from a good family. And he wasn't, didn't look like us. But second service, the Holy Ghost starts moving. Altar call. We used to line up singing all over because we used to have altar calls that lasted more than five minutes. <laughs> We're going back there. Amen. He just trotted up on the platform and got him a microphone and started singing. Now, in our way of thinking, oh my goodness, they can't do that. We just don't operate like that around here. But the truth is, everybody ought to feel that way. They should feel so much at home, Brother David, that they just said, I think I'm going to go up there and sing. We're not going to throw them out. We're not going to kill them. We're not going to, you know, put a great big S on their back that says sinner in case anybody's worried. But really, everybody ought to feel that comfortable. Yeah, right. You know, what the, yes, ma'am. Remember what he said? The church was out. He came up to me and he said, Whoop, I almost caught the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he said, I almost caught the Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> Brother G.L.? Yes, sir. I think a lot of times people is good at like showing love if you're not very good at taking it. That's why people can't get the Holy Ghost because they really don't know how to accept love. So that takes us back to the very beginning. 
when you understand, you can't earn God's love. Right. You can't be that good. Mm-hmm. Cannot. I, don't, I think if you can't take love very well, you don't even understand what love is. That's means. exactly right. I think that's what becoming perfect yes. complete in His love is we have learned right. to be able to accept love. Uh, I, I saw a story on Facebook, and sometimes there's good stuff on Facebook. Trust me. And then the story was the, the restaurant was packed out. Yeah. And anybody else see that about the little baby? Good. Oh, it was an incredible story. The a family, a husband and wife, and their little boy named Eric are out to eat. And there's a homeless dude hanging out in the restaurant. Drunk, got big old bulgy veins, stinky, nasty. And he played peekaboo, peepie, all kinds of games, clear across the restaurant with the little baby. The whole meal. And the mama was like, oh my goodness, what in the world? They're going to think he's with us. They're going to think that we know him. And he's just like, peepie, peepie, peepie. You know, just acting all crazy. Well, they got ready to leave, and they had to. She said, "I hope we don't have to walk by him. I hope we don't have to walk by him." Yeah, we had to walk by him, and they walked by him, and the little baby just starts reaching for the old geezer, and so the old geezer picked him up, and the little fella just wrapped his little fat arms all up around the old boy, love all over him. And the old man patted him on the back, and then it said tears started running down out of his face. And he said, you just made my Christmas. You just made my Christmas because the little baby didn't know no different. That ties together with what you just said, Brother Billy. Babies don't know no different. Right. And you know what, Sister Maria? Didn't hurt nothing. But all she was afraid of was what everybody else was going to think. But the little chubby wubby baby didn't know no different. And he made that old. He said, You just gave me the best Christmas present I could ever hold to have. Because the little baby didn't know he wasn't supposed to love that guy. You understand? Do you understand that it never entered into the mind of Jesus Christ to turn somebody down because of who they were? They even remember Simon? I love that story. I love it. These Jesus is eating at Simon's house, and the town tramp comes in and starts washing Jesus' feet. And Simon says, He ain't no prophet. He's a prophet. He knows what kind of trashy woman that was washing his feet. And then Jesus spoke up because he knows what you're thinking. Oh my Lord. He knows what you're thinking, and he says, listen here, buddy. Somebody was forgiven a quarter, and somebody was forgiven a thousand dollars. Who loves the most? He said, well, the one that got forgiven the most. He said, you're exactly right. That's how it is. He said, this little gal came in here. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me a kiss. You didn't do nothing for me. Matter of fact, you brought me here to try to trip me up. But she came in here and gave everything she had because she's thankful. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know. If we get this love thing down right, you watch what kind of revival. Amen. Brother Shannon, you know the people that flocked to him, they didn't know nothing about the Moses and the law and all of that stuff. They were outcasts. Yeah. Come on, they were outcasts. They were losers. They weren't accepted. Jesus never, Jesus, not one time did he have to roll up in the town and put up a tent that said, Jesus Christ, he would serve us. Just everywhere when he loved people. He hung out with, but, but they were all right being with him. Because he loved them. You can't disguise that. You can't disguise that. Listen to me. I don't know whether it's going to be my vaccine or whether it's going to be my healing, but we're, we're going to get another chance to put our money where our mouth is. Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. And we're going to get another chance to let people know that we love them and hear me right now. I don't know what your personal feelings are, but you need to get rid of them. 
Hugging is a good thing. All right. I ain't even got to my, my lesson. I'm sorry about that, too. Verse number one, verse Corinthians 13 and 1 says, If I speak with tongues of men and angels and don't have charity, I'm just a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. All that is is a big old jar and a loud noise that don't make no sense. You go to beat on that cymbal over there, and ain't nobody singing, there ain't nobody playing, it sounds stupid, it's on your nerves. Right? Y'all right. want me to prove it? Okay? That's all it is. It's nothing. But when it fits together, that's, that's what it is. You don't stop off about your religion and about this and that or the other, and you don't love people, you're the same thing as a big old clowning noise, clanging noise that nobody want to hear. That's what the book says. Okay. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all ministry and knowledge and have all faith so that I can move mountains and I don't have love, I'm nothing. I am nothing. If I foretell the future, understand the mysteries of God, if I do all kinds of miracles, signs, and wonders, and don't love people, I am nothing. If I give everything I got to feed the poor, hear me right now. If I give everything I got to feed the poor, and I get my body to be burned, and I don't have charity, and it probably me nothing. I'll give nothing if I don't have love. We can say we have love, but if we don't show it, we're lying. There are eight things the Word says that love does and eight things that the Word says it does not do. Let's go through them real quickly. There are only paper there. You might want to take some notes. I don't know. Love is patient and love is kind. Now, I had an issue with patience, but ain't nobody in here going to say how do you know your husband loves you? Or how do you know your wife loves you? Or how do you know your kids love you? Nobody's going to say, oh, they're patient. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. Let me ask you something right now. Where is patience? If you say somebody has patience, where is it? It's within us. It is. It's proven in our actions, but it's within us. Listen to me about these things here real quickly. Impatience and the frustration that comes from it are because of one reason. Because there's a situation you can't control. Impatience, hear me right now, impatience is really about me and what I want. It ain't about nobody else. But it's about me and what I want. Think about it. God is long-suffering. Has patience. Reconcile that. I said it earlier. Reconcile that truth with how it's been applied in your life. Through the Spirit. Oh, brother. I don't know whether to go there or not. I've been thinking about that. Think about how patient God has been with you. Think about it. But then the next state thing you have to ask yourself is does my life align with the patience God has shown me? And then it says kindness. Where's kindness at? How do you know? When you say somebody has a kind heart, how do you know? Because they sit around and sing kumbaya? Because they're kind. They're gracious to more people. Kind. Kindness literally is when you are full of service to others. The third characteristic of the love of God, the perfect love, the love that you got to have, the love that's the most important thing, is love does not envy. Look at here. If I got any idea of what that means, I know we're going to think about it being jealous. But it comes from the Greek word zelu. And that word zelu is actually designed 
Does anybody in here know? We got a teacher or two in here. They better know. Anybody here know what onomatopoeia is? What is it, Sister Heidi? It's where the word is like the sound, like pop or bam. That's exactly right. This is an onomatopoeia word. And it is designed to sound. What did you say, brother? Yeah, I, I like the word onomatopoeia. That's kind of why I like to use it here. But it is designed to sound like what it is. The word envy, the Greek word zilu. It is designed to sound like a pot boiling. Because the word literally means to boil. And it means to be moved with envy, hatred, or anger. Now hear me right now. There's nothing wrong with those feelings rising up in you. Where's the wrong at? No. If you act on it, you done went past. What's the, where's the wrong at? It rises up in you. What do you do? Squash it out. Get it out of you. Stop it. Remember I taught you Max McConnell's book about be anxious for nothing. You're the boss of what goes on in here. When you feel the stupid rising up in you. Because listen to me. Rash anger is overloaded with stupid. Huh? Listen. How many of you have ever got mad and then said something? I tell you, blah, 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 blah. and then about the next day you wake up and think, why didn't somebody stop me? Okay? Oh, that, that, uh, the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God, period. Okay? So, envy means when you let that stuff start rising up in you, that jealousy, that anger, that hatred. Remember, I told you one time that the Bible says jealousy is cruel as a grave. You know what that means? I wish you were dead so I could have your stuff. Say what? Jealousy is cruel as a grave. If you're jealous about it, you wish they didn't have it so you could. Okay, envy. Don't have no room in the house of God. I'm going to talk about some stuff. Am I doing all right, Brother Blake? Okay. Even though I made fun of you just a little bit? Okay. Fourth characteristic. Love is not a braggart. It does not continually tout one's own accomplishments. It does not continually talk about its own good deeds or its own abilities. It is not a braggart. The fifth characteristic Love is not arrogant. That simply means prideful or humble. That means you think you're better than somebody else. We better get the realization that we ain't better than nobody. Right. Remember the Corinthian church? They're talking about all these demons and all these sinners. And Paul says, such were some of you. It's just because of the grace of God that you're not anymore. What would happen how many of you would be proud if all of a sudden the Lord made a TV come out of the top of our head and it showed everything you thought? Uh, huh? It wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be good. No telling what they could say about us, but I tell you what, I've had some thoughts come into my mind. I didn't know where they came from. Like they were so stupid, I was I was ashamed and embarrassed. I thought that TV has fried it out on my head. We're not better than nobody. No. We're not. But the sixth characteristic, I'm going to talk about this a minute. I hope everybody's listening, everybody's watching. I'm coming down the home stretch. I promise I am. The sixth characteristic is this love of God, this perfect love, is not rude. Act like you got some manners. It is not nice ever to tell somebody their dress is ugly, their breath stinks, it's, you don't like their car, why? I must be making some folks nervous for the Terrence. Listen to me just a minute. Can I tell you something? Manners are still good. We live 
live in the rudest world that has ever existed. The church needs to manifest and demonstrate good manners. And the love of God is not rude. It don't matter who it is. And let me tell you something. They used to send ladies to something called finishing school. You know what that was for? Teach them manners. How to act. Let me tell you something. I, I just, I'm just going to be plain right now. If you're the first one in the line at every potluck, you need to learn some manners. I'm not, if you're elderly, I want you there first. If you got a problem, I want you there first. But if you're 14 years old and you're running over people to get to be first in line, you need your bottom spank. Because I'm telling you right now, I lived at home till I was 20 years old. And if I would have run to the front of the line, my daddy would have whooped my tail. Probably in front of everybody. Because let me tell you something. He was watching. I'm just telling you how it was. That's rude, Sister Maria. You know what rude is? Rude is all about me. I say what I want, whatever I think, do what I want. It's all about me. No, it's not. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, it automatically becomes all about everybody else. I'm doing some good teaching tonight. I don't care if you like it or not. Use some manners. It's not okay for little kids to call grown folks by their first name. Amen. Teach your children to call them brother and sister in the house of God and minister in business. And if you're doing a good job, let me tell you something. When you're doing a good job, you raise up your kids and they'll call everybody brother and sister. Yeah. Am I doing all right, Sister Maria? <coughs> the Holy Ghost makes you have respect for people. We can't be rude. And I don't care how old you are or how much seniority you have, it does not give you a pass on being ugly to people. <laughs> Brother Shannon, we got to get in order. And if we're ugly to people, we got to stop. We got to start having some manners. All right, I'm going to move on. I don't want to, though. But the Holy Ghost is telling me to. Seventh characteristic. Love is not self-seeking. That means love is not demanding. Love is not hard to get along with. Love does not make everything about them. And love does not insist on having its own way. Sometimes love lets somebody else be the boss. I'm feeling pretty good right now. Okay. Eighth characteristic. The love of God is not easily angered nor provoked. The love of God is not irritable, grouchy, contrary, or downright angry. Am I doing all right, Sister Lee? Okay. You were just looking at me kind of funny right there for a minute. I was wondering. The ninth characteristic, God have mercy on us right now before I say this one. If you have the love of God in you, you cannot hold a grudge. It does not keep a record of who's done you wrong. Boy, I'm stalking on toes right now. Some of them in my own. I haven't heard this already. Come on, I can belly ache with the best of them. It ain't good either. Look at here, the tenth characteristic. Are you ready? Are the tanks not doing okay? Okay. You just ain't say amen in a minute. I'm nervous. The tenth characteristic, love does not take delight or pleasure in unrighteousness. Now here me tell you what that let me tell you what that is. The love of God is not happy. When somebody gets what's coming to them. Right. Make sense, Brother Larry? 
The love of God is not, mm, I love it, they got what was coming to them. No. The love of God is sad when they get what's coming to them. The letter characteristic is connected to the tenth one, and it rejoices when truth prevails in someone's life. That means when somebody who deserves the old what goes around comes around, don't get it. But it goes a step further, Brother Shannon. It says they deserved what goes around comes around, but they believed the truth and God saved them. Yeah. I've been preaching that and it's been happening and we're not winning at it. But there's going to be people that God brings to the house of God that you don't like. Right. That they've done you wrong. Legitimately wrong. But you're going to have to be happy when God saves them. All right. Twelve characteristic. Love never gives up. This is a very important one. I wish I could talk about it a little while. But it means they seek to protect. Look at here. It literally means to become a roof that water can't get through. You know what that means, Sister Maria? Love seeks to become a covering. Would that be the same covering that, like Jesus said, when he covered the baby chicks with their wings and we would do that to others? It'd be the same thing, Brother Larry, as Moses up on top of the mountain after he broke the tablets and the children of Israel laid a calf and the Lord told Moses, mm, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, and the Lord told Moses, and said, let me tell you something. Let me wipe them all out. And I'm going to start over with you. And you know what Moses said? Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. He said, well, if you're going to take them out, take me out to it. They didn't know it, Brother David. They'd up on the mountain. Moses, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Moses was standing in the gap for them. Even though he was mad at them. Even though they had done wrong. That love. You see, he had a vested interest in them because the Lord said, go get my people and bring them out. And the hand of the Lord was on them and they came out through the blood and they came out through the water and they came out under the cloud. These are the people of God. They just got stupid for a minute. Yes, sir. Covering. Seek to be a covering. Seek to be a protected until they get it right. An advocate, the 13th characteristic, simply always hopeful, always believing. The 14th characteristic is believes all things. Now that's not talking about being gullible or naive or Pollyanna or any of that kind of stuff, but it's simply choosing to be optimistic. Why would you choose to be optimistic? Where does love come from? came from God. And where did it really come from? God toward me. That's the love I'm sharing. Is the love God showed toward me. And you know what, Brother Shannon? He didn't never decide I was going. And hear me right now. God can do anything for anybody. And He can save anybody anytime, any place. All things are possible. The 15th characteristic. Oh, Lord. Endures all things. Hear me now. Means bears up, holds up. Look at there. Is not a complainer. Is not a victim. That's the love of God. You know how you cannot be a victim? Because God brought me here, and God's going to take me out of here. He loves me. He's not against me. He's for me. The 16th characteristic. Love never fails. Love never fails. Love never comes off its throne. It never loses its place. The actual reference, the word fail, refers to the fading of a flower. Like when a flower comes into bloom and then it lives through its season and then it dies. The love that we're talking about don't go through seasons. It's the same all the time. Stand with me if you would.
Brother David handed a wall of gold. He said the fruit of the Spirit. The first fruit in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 23, tells us is love. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Listen to me. You can't walk out of here tonight and decide, I'm going to start doing all that. Can't do it. The only way you can do that is by the Spirit. The only way we're going to arrive at this, how plain was I tonight? Pretty cock, pink and plain. The only way we're going to arrive at this is the Spirit works through us. Sister Marie, you can't be that good on your own. I want to be. I'd like to be. Ideally it is. But it ain't. This only comes by the Spirit. Lord, we love you tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you want my life to be ordered. And, and I may not be jacked up in every area that we talked about tonight, but there's some of them I need to work on. And I pray, God, that you'll keep showing me, and keep bringing it to my mind, and keep working on them. I heard the word, and the word gave me a promise that there's going to be a great revival. There's going to be an exceeding great army that's going to rise up in the valley. In the valley that was dry bones is now a valley of revival. So, Lord, I want to get it right. I want to get myself lined up. I want it to be line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. I want to live in the narrow path and go through the straight gate. I, I don't want to just barely get by. I don't want to wonder at the end of the day. But, Lord, I want to have confidence in the love that you have for me. Let it spread abroad in this church. And let us work real hard, God, to be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh so we can love like you love us. We can love others. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, uh, we will have service. And uh, it's going to be good. Uh, come 10.30 and pray. 11 o'clock service. We're going to keep on wearing masks for a little while longer. I think the numbers are decreasing across the county. So, you, you know, if you, uh, if you choose not to, we're not going to beat you up for it. We're just asking you that you be cooperative. And uh, are there any other announcements? We love you. God bless you. You're dismissed. Yeah, I think. Who was? 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 Who was?